Decide the way you walk. Amen. Whatever you say. <laughs> out to please. You need a, a technical department. Oh, yeah. you, you know, like a okay, good morning. Everything's fine. Don't worry. Don't need anything. We need Mashiach. That's the only thing. We don't need no technical problem. We need basic Mashiach, and then we'll, we'll be fine. Amen. Okay, so good morning, everybody. As we go to the uh, this beautiful Pashas, Pasha B'Shalach, it's a packed portion. This Shabbos is called uh, Shabbos Shira, the Shabbos of song. It has the Oz uh the man from heaven. A lot of beautiful things. The crossing of the sea, splitting of the sea, unbelievable stuff. This class is called The Theory of Everything. Appreciating the underlying oneness in everything, including you. Okay. So we're going to start as follows. We start this class in text number 1A, which is in uh, page 80 in your book. 80. Page 80, correct. No. 80. Page 58. Oh, I got the wrong question. Wrong I'm question. sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Wrong, 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 wrong. Page 50, 60, 50, 59, really. 59, 59. So over here, the, the, the book starts off with um, uh, write down five roles you assume on an average day. Wow. Write down five rule, uh, ro roles you assume on an average day. Your parent, you're a teacher, you're a spouse, you're a child, you're a friend, you're a, you're a businessman. Write down five things you, that you uh, that you uh, you do. And now, if you wrote down those five things, uh, let's uh, let's scale from one to five. Uh, maximum being one, being being five, and uh, one being minimum. Okay. Uh, if you would, uh, you would uh, figure out what is more important, well, how much time maximum you invest in each one of these things, maximum being number five, minimum being number number one. Um, then ask this question. Then answer this question. Do you feel any? Do you feel that these roles conflict with each other? In other words, if your number is less than five on any item in this list, you feel that the other items wouldn't exist in your life or any or all, that number would be higher. So that's the question. So if I put if I put one of them as number four, why is it number four? Is because something else in that list is holding you back from being number five? See, everybody did this well. Nobody's doing that. I was writing. <laughs> hey, you got the point. How is it possible? And that's why the truth is it could be we never do anything 100%. We are multitasking, doing a lot of things and doing nothing. A jack of all trades, a professional at none. And uh, why? Because we're not giving 100%. And the question is, could we give 100%? Is it possible to give 100% to each and everything? And if it's impossible to give 100% to each and everything, that's why I'm doing ultimately nothing. So, that the Rebbe is going gonna, is gonna to bring about this point, bring out this aspect, this aspect that we could, we should do everything 100%. Task that the Abish that gives you you should do it 100%. And how do we do that? How do we accomplish, do every task 100%? When you have to go to the next task, or you have to change, you have to do the next, next object, the next mission. So how do you do that? How do you do everything 100%? Because that's what you need to do. If you're not going to do 100%, it's not going to be complete. And how can you accomplish a task in life if you're not going to give it 100%? See, the moment never ends. <laughs> Let's go to the pasuk. Okay, so on page 60. We're holding on page 60. Do we find an interesting verse, right? Uh, the whole pasuk, the whole prayer this week is interesting verse. But 
The Jewish people have a go out of Mitzrayim. They leave Egypt. They come to the Red. They come to the to the, the, the Red Sea. They are stuck between the Egyptians and the and 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 the sea. God says to them, "One mission. You got one mission. Your mission is not to cry, not to pray, not to do anything. You have one mission in life: is to journey. Keep on trucking. That's all your mission is." Your mission is, you have one mission. You need to reach one place. What is that place? Mount Sinai. That's your mission. Your mission is to reach Mount Sinai, not to do anything but to reach this mountain. That's your mission. Your mission is to keep on traveling. Right? So the Jewish people travel. They, they go into the sea. The sea splits for them to accomplish their mission. They come, they, the sea splits for them. Suddenly the Egyptians come after them. And the Egyptians drown. Right? The Egyptians all drown. And after that, it says the following verse. Okay, this is the following verse after the old Egyptians drowned. Vayasa Moshe b'nei Yisrael miyansha. Vayasa, that's the word. Vayasa means Moshe made the Jewish people journey from the answer. Vayasa, doesn't say they used to when they traveled. Vayasa, he made them journey. And they went into the desert. They went through three days and they didn't find war. That's the Pasuk. Well, what's interesting is the first verse in this Pasuk. He made them journey. What is the meaning? Why did he make them journey? Why, did, why wouldn't they journey? So they thus crossed the sea. Selfless, they all knew that that was not the end. They, they, they have to keep on journeying. That's the mitzvah. The mitzvah was at one mitzvah, journey. Vayisu. Dabo B'nai Yisrael, speak to the Jewish people. Vayisu, they should journey. That's it. Follow the cloud. Follow the yellow brick road. Follow the cloud. Keep on going. Right? She says on the verse, Moshe made Israel journey. He had to schlep them away from the edge of the river. Why? Moshe led the Jews away from against their will. Why? For the Egyptians that adorned their horses and their ornaments with gold and silver and precious stones. And the Israelites were finding them at the sea were busy collecting money. Busy collecting money. Right? So here the Jews, Moshe said, well, we got to go. We, we got to go. We, we got to we, we, we gotta collect the cash. And the plunder of the sea was greater than the plunder of Egypt. He has a, he's, he's, he wants to go. The cloud is going. The Jewish people are busy collecting, collecting all the gold. But Moshe Rabbeinu had to say, okay, enough is enough. Get away from it. You got to leave. We got to leave against their will. They left. Why did the, why did the uh, army of Egypt Wealth with them. Why did they own their chariots with? Because that's what God wanted them to do. That the Jewish people should collect all the money. So self understood that they would collect all the money. That they would empty out Egypt for all the money. But the question is not on that. That's not the question over here. The question is why were the Jewish people so preoccupied in collecting money? And why did Moshe Rabbeinu? So the answer, which is a powerful question, because why did they need all this money? 90 Gemara Medrash says each one had 90 donkeys full of. Uh, no, no, no. The answer is simple. Because they had a mitzvah to collect the money. Just like there was a mitzvah to, to journey, there was a mitzvah to make sure to go out with as much as gold and silver you can go out with. Right? So, uh, so therefore, in Exodus, no, it's a pasuk in the Torah. Hashem nasan echein am beinu mitzrayim that the the Abish to gave the 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 favor in the people the Egyptians that they lent them money and they emptied out Egypt. It was a mitzvah to empty out Egypt. Sure to take as much as money you can get out of Egypt. As I mentioned Ashi last week, was of Abraham, whatever. Or pichsidis is not because of money; it's because of the tzutzis, the spiritual aspects in in in, in Egypt, right? Shavayashilum. Now she says, 
They lent them even what the Israelites did not request. The Egyptians gave them. The Jews would say, lend me one. And they just said, no, take two and go. So they emptied out Egypt of its money. Now, this was, as we say, go further. This was that the Abishter wanted. It's not that Stam Jews were just trying to get even. This was a command by God. And it's a very, as we know, a very interesting expression that says in the verse, it's right in front of you on page 62. In, in the book of Exodus, chapter 11, verse 2, it says, Please, the Abishter begs by the Jews this mitzvah. Right? The mitzvah traveling, God just says travel. Over here, God says, please. I want you to do this. Speak in the, in the ears of the people and let them borrow each man from his friend and each woman from his friend silver vessels and golden vessels. I want them to go out with gold and silver. Whatever the reason is, I'm not that important over here. But the Abishta wanted this mitzvah. This was a command by you. That's like he commanded them to break the carbon paste out, to give the sacrifice of the, of, the, uh, of the Passover, or to walk into the sea. He commanded them, begged by them, that they would take gold and silver. Right? And how she says, the Gemara brings up the Gemara in text number 4a. Please speak to the ears of Israel. The students of the school of Yanni said, please is nothing more than an expression of supplication. God says to Moshe, I beg you, go and tell the Israelites, I beg you, borrow vessels of silver and vessels and gold from the Egyptians. In order to fill my promise I made to Abraham in the covenant between the, between the pieces so that the, that the righteous person, Abraham, will not say, God fulfilled this pronouncement and they, they, and they will be enslaved and afflicted. But God did not fulfill his pronouncement and afterwards they went there with a great with great processions. So you're cold? No. So, um, so, uh, so, so, so there, there was a command. There was a mitzvah. God begged the Jews to take the money. If, that's why the Jews were busy taking the money. They were doing a mitzvah. They were doing what God wanted them to do. Right. So in essence, the Jewish people, if you would come to them, now why, the truth is, why did God have to ask this, no, please? Why did God have to ask this, this an expression of please? This is self-understood. Here the Jewish people are in slavery in 210 years in slavery. And now they're given a chance to leave. The Gemara says actually that they were supposed to leave earlier, but they left a little later because of this mitzvah. 400 years. It was a couple of hours earlier. It was a couple of hours that they were that they left early, they left later. They're supposed to be a couple of hours earlier, earlier, but God says. I'm going to delay the, the going out of Egypt because I want this mitzvah to be done. Now, if you go to the Jews, you say, listen, you can get out of jail at 12 o'clock. Or you can stay in jail till 1230, but you get 100 bucks. Who wants to be in jail another minute for 100 bucks? Don't, I, it's a tough question to ask. So, uh, there's uh, 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 a very famous uh, story of the Nazi. It was a great rabbi in the 1500s when uh, it was a Jew that was in, in prison. And they, uh, the, uh, the pundits those days, the, 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 the landowner said, I'll give you one day to go out of prison every year. So he wrote to this rabbi, he said, I don't know which day should I pick. Should I pick him Kipper? Should I pick uh, Passover to be my family? Should I pick Rosh Hashanah? Which day should I pick? And the, the answer was, today. <laughs> today. <laughs> today. <laughs> today. Right? Because right now, you can do a mitzvah. You can go out of jail and put on tefillin and you can be with your family. Today. 
right? So who would say, you know what? Oh, I'll stay in jail another, another seven months for, for what's going to happen in seven months. But the same thing is, text number 4b, the school of Rabiane continued, Israel said to Moses, if only we can get out ourselves. This is analogous to a guy in prison. And people say to him, we promise we will release you tomorrow and give you much money. He says, I beg you, release me today. And I know not anything. Release me today. I'm getting out of here. And, and, and don't give me money. Who wants to be in a dungeon, in a prison, on a, another day because you didn't get some money? Again, I don't know. Uh, today might be different. But uh, in normal situations. <laughs> right? Uh, so the question is, the question, that's why it's a mitzvah. Now you understand why the collecting the money was a mitzvah. Yid were longer in Mitzrayim. So to fulfill a commandment by God that they should take out of Mitzrayim all the money. Why is this important? Why is this important? Why is this, this question important? Right? You have a, you have a mitzvah you, you, that you sow. The Abish to want you to get out of Egypt. And then he gives you a mitzvah to collect money, which automatically you're going to have to stay in Egypt. That's why God says, please, I'm asking you to do another mitzvah. Right? I want to get you out of here. I want you to go, but I have a mitzvah, the mitzvah of, 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 of acquiring wealth. Yes? I'm a little confused. Yes, what are you confused? I thought they took all no, they didn't take anything during oh, that. They, it they out. checked so it out. They didn't take. They said. Okay, so mm. this whole, like, this all took place. Passover. Correct. After the Passover Seder in Egypt, and people, it was a busy day, and they were ready to run, but they couldn't run because first they had to go to the taskmasters. You have to realize. They had to go to the Egyptians that they were slaves to and ask them for money. This was a very interesting question. Very, I'm sure the Jews itself were very uncomfortable in this whole thing, right? You're going to the guy who was yesterday your boss and you're asking him for, to give you money. That's why, that's what the Pasuk says, that, that the Abish to put, a, the God put upon the Egyptians, that not only they gave them money, they gave them more money. So that was double an unusual situation that the Jewish people should ask and that the Egyptians should give. They have some kind of the Jewish people to ask, was he needed? It was not a miracle. You had to you had to beg them to do it. That's why you understand why God begged them to do it. Because why would a Jew want to do it? Let's leave. And why would a Jew want to go to the, the Egyptian guy who was yesterday beating him up to ask him for money? It's a very uncomfortable situation, but it's a mitzvah. It was the mitzvah. It was the mitzvah that God asked the Jewish people to get this money. They were commanded to go. So maybe if we ask the Jews, in essence, do you want to go with money or do you don't? They would say, well, let's get out of here. The way we get money is by asking some Egyptian for money. Why don't ask the Egyptian for money? Let's get out of here. Let's go. We'll worry about the money later. The truth is, that the Jewish people received more money at the business yam. Now the question, the question is even, the, I mean, the phenomenal mitzvah is even greater that God gave them all the money they needed seven days later. It was more money than what they asked for. So, so that, you see, the Ebishter wanted this mitzvah. He wanted the Jews. He could have done it without it. And he did it ultimately seven days later. He gave them an unbelievable abundance of money. Right? More than they can ever imagine. So the Abish wanted this mitzvah. <laughs> For whatever reason, go talk to God. He wanted this mitzvah that he would that, that suddenly in the 15th day of the month, when everything is happening and they're ready and the Egyptians are chasing them out, they should stop whatever they're doing. And every man should go to his uh, Egyptian friends and ask them for money. And every woman, not only men, but women should do that also. Every woman should go. Maybe that's why they had no time to bake anything. But they, they, they were busy asking from their friends, the Egyptian neighbors and friends, to give them money. And that was the Abish to beg the Jewish people to do it. Maybe he wanted them to uh, 
It mentioned on Shabbos, the Rebbe speaks about that too. So that, whatever, that they shouldn't walk out as, 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 as uh, they shouldn't walk out as slaves. But that's a, okay, that's a beautiful concept. That's a, but here, in essence, that the Abish they gave this myth, figure out, let the money fall from heaven. The Abish can figure out a way. But the Abish they want that, uh, that, that the Jew should ask. That's the mitzvah. They should ask for the money. And now, why would Egyptian want to give the money? The Egyptian want to get rid of them. Why suddenly the Egyptian want to give the money? That the Torah says. So really the question is, that Torah says that God put chain, God put kindness in the eyes of the Egyptians, that they gave them money. Not only gave them money, they gave them more than they, the, the, the money that they, that, 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 that they wanted. So the question is, on this concept, on this concept, we have a general argument. There's a question to Gemara. Because this is a big question. The question is, as you'll see in text number five, and it brought on Shukhan Aruch, now the Rebbe Shukhan Aruch. When, what should you do if I have an opportunity presents you itself to perform a mitzvah and the study of Torah at the same time? You have two obligations, two mitzvahs. What do you do? Right? So the answer is, if the mitzvah can be performed by somebody else, do not interrupt your studies. Even if you are studying something like the laws pertain to the temple, which no longer practically relevant today, it doesn't make a difference. You're studying Torah. And study of Torah, as we say in, 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 in every morning, is more important than anything else. Right? So if the mitzvah can be done by somebody else, let them let them let the other person do it. If the mitzvah cannot be performed by anyone else, you must inter interrupt your study and perform the mitzvah. And then return to your studies. Examples include such cases as when giving charity and you are a better candidate to give and you are a better candidate to give as your words will be more comforting to the recipient, right? So you might say, well, let somebody else give the charity. But since I know how to, since if I would know, I'm the person maybe knows how to give charity better than somebody else. As out of example, I'm more comforting. I'm a, I'm a, nicer, I'm a nicer giver than somebody else. So then I have to stop learning and give charity. Another example includes the case of when a person's performance will be inadequate, for example, when there aren't enough people to escort, to escort the deceased. Let's say I'm in the middle of learning and now I hear that there's a funeral and there's no minion to the funeral. I need 10 men and there's no minion. I'm the 10th man. So I should stop learning and go do the mitzvah. A burial of helping a burial. It goes without saying that this rule extends to mitzvahs that are rabbinical origin, origin, such as prayer. For such mitzvahs, you must interrupt your studies to perform them with all the details that it entails, right? After all this, in the entire purpose of humanity, as our sages stated, the purpose of wisdom is for tshuva and good deeds. Right? So the whole purpose of your learning is what to do. <laughs> and if you're not going to do the mitzvah because you're learning, then you missed up the purpose of learning. So here it gives example, Torah and a mitzvah. He gives example, Torah and mitzvah. The same would be in a mitzvah and a mitzvah. But the, 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 the classical example, is, is, is the Gemara is this example. The classical example, if you have Torah, which everybody agrees that Torah is impo more important. You say, as I said in your davening, Talmud Torah can negate kulam. The learning of Torah surpasses everything. But not when a mitzvah cannot be done by somebody else. It does not surpass it. Because then you are missing the, the, the point. So if I'm going to learn Torah, I'm not going to daven with a minion, for example, because my learning is more important. No, you need to stop and you need to dominate. I think one of the mitzvahs is third part of another person. Sometimes, yeah. Mitzvah, a mitzvah can be done by somebody else. I can give you to give charity, and that's like I did the mitzvah. There is a concept of, a, of somebody else doing a mitzvah for you. Certain mitzvahs, I kind of ask you to put on tefillin for me, because that's, that's a mitzvah that's connected to my body. So I can't ask you to put on tefillin. But you can make Kiddush for me, for example. Right? 
You're doing a mitzvah and you're doing it for me. You can give charity for me. No, it goes to without saying that it applies to rabbinical honor. It applies to Torah and it also replies to rabbinical to rabbinical things. It goes without saying. If I say it by that's the Kalva Homer, that's the classical. If I say it that it applies to Torah, it surely applies to rabbinical. Honor. If it, if one does not do so, it turns out that they have studied but are not practiced for such people. For, and for such people, it will be preferable for the embryo, <laughs> that's a good mother, <laughs> would have uh, overturned and they would never see the light of the world. Well, I don't know why they have to put that in my hand. So whatever. <laughs> Sometimes, very right, right. Okay, but that's the out there. Listen, Shukhana, it's a good mother. It's in essence. Why? Because they have missed the point of the world. I mean, that's, that's the Tanya of today. You cannot accomplish in the world without the mitzvah. Forget it. And that's the whole purpose of creation. If you don't do the mitzvah, you haven't accomplished in the purpose of creation and the story. All your wisdom and all your learning will, is, it will not accomplish things in this world. The only thing that accomplishes something in this world is a mitzvah. It's the putting on the tefillin, the giving the tzedakah, the uh, lighting the Shabbos candles, the eating the food and making a bracha. It cannot be accomplished through all the study and knowledge in, in the world. And the Abishta wanted this world. And, and therefore, we need to ultimately do the mitzvah. You need to ultimately do the mitzvah. So, so in essence, when you have that struggle, you need to, you need to know you're right. You need to, and if you have a question, you ask a rabbi. But you need to know that you that that, that you can't just push off something because you're doing something else, right? You just can't just push off something always. You're doing something else. So even if I'm doing something else, halacha tells me, like I'm learning Torah, and, I'm, I'm, I, and now there's a funeral out there, and uh, what should I do? And halacha tells you, if you're the ten, if there's 10 people there, then you shouldn't stop learning Torah. Then your Torah is important. But if the, you're the 10th man, then you should. Close the book, and go, learn, go, to, go, go to the funeral. But that's unlimited. That's uh, that's uh, then the whole the whole city should close down, and that's not the, that's there's no mitzvah. You and that's a concept of uh, honor and ethical and morals, but not as the mitzvah is that they need to have ten men. So therefore, you have to stop. There's no choice. You can be the greatest rabbi. You need to stop and go to go go to the funeral. Now, if you if you you have to give covet, so even if you're a great rabbi, you have to, a million people there. You should go give covet. Self understood. But not the same thing as a person that needs a minion. Okay? It's not about COVID. It's about, about doing a mitzvah. They cannot say Kaddish. They kind of do the, the mitzvah. Uh, they, they don't, people don't realize that what, uh, it's important to, to one of the Einlam Sheh, Elvon Sheh, Einlam Sheh. People don't realize the importance of the, these mitzvahs, certain mitzvahs. We say it every day in our David. Einlam Sheh, you don't realize that what you acquire by helping out a person that needs a minion at a funeral. You don't realize. The great mitzvah you accomplish because they need it. So now that so th therefore the Jewish people were given a mitzvah. They were given a mitzvah in Mitzrayim to uh, to get money, right? To get money, physical money, cash, gold, silver. So, according to Hasid, this is even surely understood, right? Because not that they needed the money. According to Hasidut, they wanted to empty out. The money was symbolic for the holy sparks of godliness that was in the world, right? That was in the world of Egypt. That's how Hasidut, Kabbalah, looks at the whole situation. So that's why the Altar Rebbe says in text number six, collecting Egyptian wealth redeemed 202 godly sparks trapped in Egypt, I saw. It's about this effort that the verse saying they emptied out Egypt. So you can imagine the Jews, if they understood the spiritual concept of it, surely they were busy with the money. They had to accomplish their mission. 
to empty out all the 202 spots. And if they would have left one uh, one uh, gold nugget at the, at the at the sea, then maybe that spark wouldn't have been elevated. That's a different question. <laughs> That's a different question. <laughs> okay, to the bottom over here, it says that the, the practice, the practice, the precise number two or two is not explained. That it's based on a verse, it's a verse, Rav 202, Rav Lachan. So it's 202. That's a spiritual concept and it's above, uh, above my prayer grade. Okay. So it's bitter on its It's called the bitter on the refinement of the sparks that fell into Egypt. It's really raised in base of 352, but there was a, the, the, in Egypt, there was 202 Nutsutsis that fell into Egypt. That's why it's, it's the symbolic of, so it's a majority of Nutsutsis fell into Egypt. That's why, in essence, the majority of, of these sparks was in Egypt. They rectified 202. There's another 50 sparks that fell into the rest of the world. And that's what we're still busy with. So there's 200. Right, base, yeah. No, no, we rectified away 202. Yeah. So there's 50 left. We've been busy for thousands of years to, to rectify these sparks. <laughs> he gave us it without a treasure map, but that's what they were all over the world. That's why the Jews went all over the world. We've been all over the world to, to find the sparks in every part of the world. Okay, but that's a, that's a separate class. So if we understand that concept of Kuni Chasidut, so then the Jewish people were surely involved in in getting in, in collecting money. So therefore, 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 Moses had to push it, rip them away, and told them, We gotta, we have another mitzvah. We have another mitzvah. What's the mitzvah? Everybody got to involve the money. What is the mitzvah? By you so to go to the mountain. We got another mitzvah. What do you mean? I know you're involved in the mitzvah. We got another mitzvah. In essence, Moses or Moses responded to the to the Jews. I know you have a mitzvah, but you have another mitzvah. Going back again, uh, <laughs> what? I would check you. Have, has anyone gone back to the Red Sea and tried to find it? Or read, read, see what? See of reads. Oh, see the read, the read, see the read, see. Yeah, I'm so okay. See of reads or red, see. The question is, has anyone gone with oh. salvaging equipment and tried to dig into the mud? And look, because you okay. get all the gold. There might still be more gold and silver. Yeah. Okay. So the question is, so so when the Jewish people were at the at the edge of the sea, the sea, and they saw their gold, could they could they give this mitzvah to anybody else? No. Anybody else? They were given a mitzvah, the Jewish people, not only men, women, everybody was given this mitzvah. So now you can understand why it means that all the Jews were doing a mitzvah. They couldn't give it to somebody else. Each one had a mitzvah to get as much as gold as they can get. And here they had a mitzvah that God has commanded them. So how can they change to another mitzvah? So the question is even stronger now. The question is really the strong question. Why did Moshe Rabbein take him away from the mitzvah? <laughs> Why did Moshe Rabbein force him away from the mitzvah? They were busy with a mitzvah. They were busy with a mitzvah. So if they're busy with a mitzvah, let them finish the mitzvah. There won't be one nugget left on the, at, at, the, at the edge of the sea. And then they'll travel on.
I'm not dealing with with with, with anti-Semitism. It's a mitzvah. What do you want? Go talk to God. It's a mitzvah. That's what God wanted. You have any complaints? Go to Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Talk to Him. God says, "I am worried about Abraham." That's God's uh, excuse. I worry about Abraham. What do you want for my life? Uh, Abraham's gonna gonna complain that they went without any money. That's it. I gotta get him to get money. The problem, self understood, that, that that's anti Semitism. I'm not gonna deal with it. Over here, the Abish said a mitzvah. You cannot argue with that. Here's a mitzvah. I don't know if the Abish tells you a mitzvah to go and get money. That, there's no, there was never such a mitzvah. There's no such mitzvah. But over here, there was a mitzvah. That's it. There's a mitzvah. It's a, it's a plastic in the Torah. It's a verse in the Torah. Alone, uh, alone, it's a separate mitzvah. The problem is, small problem is, just like there's a mitzvah. So now you, here you have a, the problem is here both mitzvahs are from the Abishta. What do we do with that kind of situation, right? We have a mitzvah to collect all the money. We have a mitzvah to be so. What do you do? Both of them are commanded by God. So how are you, while you're doing this mitzvah of collecting this gold, you have a mitzvah to go. Now, what do you do? How do I go? How do I do? Go, go? No, I got to do the mitzvah. Yeah, but you so. You got to do it now. Mitzvah Mitzvah comes to your hand. Don't uh, push it away. So they had a mitzvah to do the A. They had a mitzvah to do B. How do you do both mitzvahs? <laughs> And we all know, and we all know, that's it. So, but, but they seemingly that God wanted them to do mitzvahs. They, they should collect the money and then move out. I need to, I, I'm doing a mitzvah right now. Hold on a minute. I got to do the mitzvah. I got to finish the mitzvah. Then, uh, then tell me to go out. How can I do the two mitzvahs together? And we all know, so in text number seven, that that was, I mean, isn't that the ultimate mitzvah? The mitzvah of, 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 of uh, so even in the Jewish people, if they have these two mitzvahs, collecting the money and going to going to to, wouldn't they rationalize? Say, listen, this in comparison, these two mitzvahs. What is a greater mitzvah? Going to going 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 to uh, going to uh, going to the mountain. We are we have been waiting for this, right? They're going to the mountain. We know that's the whole purpose. I mean, the whole purpose was to go to the mountain. If there's not going to the mountain, what's the purpose of this mitzvah? There's no purpose in this whole mitzvah. So as we know, God said, for I will be with you. And this is a sign that I am sent you. When you take the people out of they will worship on this mountain. And we know, text number eight, the, 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 the measure says, God established a condition to act of creation and said, if Israel accepts the Torah, you will exist. And if it does not accept, it will return to pre-mortal state, chaos and disorder. Text number eight, the Gemara Talmud. It's a Gemara. It's a Medrash, as we learned on Thursday, on Thursday, on Tuesday. So therefore, couldn't the Jews realize that how great the mitzvah to collect the money is not in comparison to the mitzvah to go to Mount Sinai. That Moshe Rabbeinu had to force them to go to Mount Sinai. So now, the Rebbe answers the question and the lesson self understood what we learned from this. Look at the words of the Rebbe. Ready? The spiritual explanation for the notion that Moshe dragged them by force. That's the, that's the Pasuk. He made he dragged them out of, he dragged them from the sea. It doesn't mean, God forbid, that the Jewish people, after the miracle of the splitting of the sea, didn't want to follow Moshe's instruction. Certainly, they would carry out Moshe's command, which is really the command of God, to travel away from the Red Sea with full devotion and joy. They would have done it 100%. They want to do it 100%. 
What then does it mean that Moshe dragged them by force? It means that, in, that it was contrary to their understanding in Teda with regard to instruction of empty Egypt. That was their struggle. It was not a physical struggle. <laughs> it, was, it was easy for them to, to leave Mitzrayim. It was easy for them to leave, leave the mitzvah and go, go, go to the thing. The struggle was that Jewish people were completely invested in the job of redeeming the captive sparks in Egypt with their entire being, such that tearing themselves away from that job was forced. That's the meaning was forced. Not it was physically forced. Since they were invested entirely in this mitzvah, they were invested in this mitzvah, doing another mitzvah is considered forced. Not that it is considered forced. If it was forced, they would go to, they would go to, to, to Mat and Teda very depressed. They went very happily to Mat and Teda. But it was forced because they were stuck in this mitzvah. That, that they did when they, a Yidin, did a mitzvah, they did it 100%. Now you have to do another mitzvah, you have to, so to say, forcefully go to another mitzvah. But not that I'm going to do mitzvah. I'm going to say that mitzvah B is more important. There I'll give my 100%. And this mitzvah is not so important. I'll only give 90%. The Yidin that were given a mitzvah, if you would ask them to begin with, they would say, I don't want this mitzvah, Bechalal, right? I, rather, I don't need this mitzvah. But here they were given a mitzvah. And they did it 100%. Nevertheless, they realized they had to do mitzvah B, which now they have to give 100% to mitzvah B. That's the forced. So they only followed suit after the acceptance of God's will, but of course, it was... A full throated, throttled commitment. There's a very famous story in the Gemara. I'll give you an analogy. The very famous story between the two great sages of Rabbi Gamaliel and Rabbi Yeshua. I'm not going to go into the whole story. Maybe you heard the story before. These are two great rabbis, and they once were arguing on the date of, uh, of the year, the calendar year. They had an argument on how to do the calendar. When, when, should, when should Rosh Hashanah be? And um, Rabbi, Rabbi Gamliel was the, 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 the leader at that time. Rabbi Shua was a great sage, was, was also one of the big sages of that time. And there was a big argument. And the, the, the difference would ultimately be when Yom Kippur falls out. On a Sunday, I'm just giving day, Sunday or a Monday. So Rabbi Shua felt it was on Monday, let's say, and Abi Gamliel felt it was on Sunday. And see, he was, he was the uh, leader. They did it. It was established on Sunday. Abi Gamliel turns to Abi Yeshua and tells him, on Monday, I want you to walk down the streets of the city with your knapsack, with your, with, your, with, your, with your briefcase and your money sack and come to my house on Monday. Even though you think Yom Kippur is on Monday. According to you, Yom Kippur is on Monday. But no, the law is going to be, it's going to be on Sunday. And you need to do that. And that's what he did. The Gemara says, I'll be sure on Monday, <laughs> which is the day he argued and fought and said Yom Kippur was on Monday. But he walked down the streets of, of uh, Yiddishalayim, wherever they were living, and he came to Rabbi Gamliel, home on Monday, Knocked on the door, he said, good morning. You know, it's not Yom Kippur. It's a, it's a regular day. Here's my, uh, you know, here's my money satchel. Here's my, it's Monday. And then Gemara says, I you know, hugged him and kissed him and said, that's the beauty, right? Did he, want it? Did he really want to do that? <laughs> but he did it with joy. Because... Even though he was 100%, Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Shua was 100% that it was Monday. He didn't, he didn't give in. He 
thought Rabbi, that, 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 that Rabbi Gilil was wrong. <laughs> His calculation was wrong. Nevertheless, he, he did what he was supposed to do with joy and happiness. But should the Jewish people have left the sea? Yes and no. <laughs> That's a very Jewish question. No, because they are doing a mitzvah. They were 100 percent involved. Yes, because they had to, they had to switch to the second mitzvah. They had to leave their 100 percent and move on to the second obligation. And not only they had to move to the second obligation by, by seemingly by force, but with joy. They had to go on the journey, even though they were 100 percent invested in this, in this, in this mitzvah. They were totally involved. They were not 90%, not 90, 80%, 100% involved. They still understood that they have to move on to the next mitzvah. They have to move on to Vayiso. Moshe Rabbeinu said, we time to move on to the next mitzvah. And I don't want you to move on because I'm forcing you to move on. <laughs> I want you to move on because I am forcing you to move on and you should do it with joy and you should do it. With, 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 with happiness and gladness. And that's what they did. They went on their journey. Look at the Fidik Rebbe. Yesterday was his yard site. The Fidik Rebbe in text number 10. The word mitzvah means to connect. One who does a mitzvah connects to God, who commands the mitzvah. This then is the, what the Talmud means. It says, the reward of a mitzvah is the mitzvah itself. Namely, the fact that a Jew is able to connect himself with God is itself the reward. To illustrate the matter, imagine a very simple person who has no concept of greater intellectual ideas. A person who doesn't even understand how distant they are from the world of rational. This person, right? They have no concept. They're simple people. So you have a person, a simple Jew. This person's entire universe is on a material matters alone. For example, the taste of food or other such matters common amongst folks. It's obvious just how little this person is able to grasp the greatness of a wise person. After all, they don't have any perception of that world at all. One day, a wise sage instructs the simple person to do something for him. Now, with this instruction, the simple person existence is born. All of a sudden, he feels his own existence in the sense that he's able to carry out the sage's wish. Wow, this sage, this great person asked me a favor. And for my world, I suddenly became a person. Nobody's been looking at me for the last 50 years. Suddenly, this sage is giving me the time of day. The sage, too, suddenly considered a simple person in a, as a viable entity. The sage, who has nothing to do with this guy because he's in his, he's in his wisdom and his great, it says, you know what? I need this person. The simple person goes from being a non-entity into something. Besides this, the very communication unites the lofty sage and the simple person. For the latter is carrying out the wishes of the former. What emerges from this communication is two things. The simple person's very identity is born. And number two, a connection is formed between the instructor and the audience. Regardless of what it is, whether it's a great or trivial matter, the main thing is this communication and it's execution. How much more? That's a mitzvah. The Eivishter, God who is infinite, comes down to me with a simple nothing and asks me to do him a favor. Ask me today in the morning to put on film. That's how I need to look at every mitzvah. The Eivishter has made me in. First of all, the Eivishter, God, made me into a something. I'm that a dust I 
What am I in this big universe? What am I in this big universe? That's why every person should realize how much they matter not to somebody else, but how much they matter to God. To the universe, I'm nothing. And then God says, I'm asking you to put on film. I'm asking you to give stock. I'm asking you to be nice. I'm, a- I'm asking you. I am the sage, let's say. First of all, that mitzvah should put you, should make you fly. Because that mitzvah makes you who you are. I'm nothing. What am I to this world? I can do nothing. But the Abish, the God made me a something. And then number two is I am a, I have communication now. <laughs> I'm doing something for God. I have communication with God. How would else I have communication with God if not through this mitzvah? It doesn't make a difference. And it's self-understood to the sage, what he, he asked the guy for a cup of coffee, let's say, or he asked him, please take take help me out with the, with my uh with my friend, you know, slept something for me, right? Well, I'm not asking the sage didn't have a conversation with the simple man about the spirituality, about his thesis in, in, in the Talmud. He asked him for a favor. Connection between this great sage and the simple person. That's why every mitzvah should give 100%. <laughs> Where should you give in a value of a mitzvah that this mitzvah I'm going to give 50% and that mitzvah I'm going to give 100%? Every mitzvah that you do, which you, which you do, what we do, is, is the connection between us and God. Why wouldn't you give 100%? Huh? Yeah. Hey, what do you want to say? Don't evaluate between one mitzvah and another mitzvah. Correct? Correct. 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 Very good. That's correct. So every mitzvah, so point number one is every mitzvah should be done 100%. Because they gave that analogy. The analogy between a sage and a simple person. Surely we are all simple people to God. Every Jew is simple. God is infinite and every Jew is finite. So we're all simple to God. And when God asks us for a mitzvah, whether we think it's a small mitzvah, whether we think it's a big mitzvah, whether we think it's a hard mitzvah, whether we think it's an easy mitzvah, doesn't make a difference. Every mitzvah I do, anything I do in this world, I should give 100%. Because the Abish is asking me, to, God is asking me for this mitzvah. And that gives, makes me who I am, that I can be one who's doing a mitzvah that God asked. And number two is, that makes my connection. Between me and God. How else can I connect to God if not with this mitzvah, not with this command? So, therefore, the Rebbe says in text number 11a, there's a powerful message that can learn from our day in our daily religious life. When a Jew is invested in a certain element of religious life, he or she must be invested in that role 100%. Whatever it might be, don't come a half with a half a head when you're coming to learn. Come 100%. When you give stock, you give it 100%. When you, that moment you're lighting the candles, give it, do it 100%. Whatever it might be, focus, give it its full attention. If that's the mitzvah. What you're doing right now, that's the mitzvah. And if that's the mitzvah you're doing right now, give it its full recognition. Give it its full, its full, its full, its full time, full purpose. Why give it a 50%? Why give it set? Why give it 90? Give Could you it- give an example, please? Because I don't really know what you mean. I, I don't know how to make this, you know, when you're eating, you're keeping kosher, you're doing whatever. I don't know. What what exactly do you mean? Give it a hundred percent. Come to Davin, give it a hundred percent. When it comes What's to what do what what mean? Don't, don't come to Davin and, 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 and you're busy with other things. Give it 100%. You have 45 minutes. Give it 100%. You're half an hour, two hours, whatever. Give it 100%. When you come to learn, give it 
When you're there to help somebody, give it 100%. Do, be present 100%. Don't give it, say, oh, you know what? This is not so important. Why should I give it 100%? That's, oh, that's more important. I'll give that 100%. Everything I do for God or for a mitzvah, give it 100%. Be focused. Be present. Be involved. Do it. 100%. Even though you might think that it's not so important to another mitzvah that you can do later. So the Jewish people were in, in, in collecting that money, which I didn't want to say why would it? Because that was the mitzvah they gave it 100%. They were involved in it 100%. They were focused on it. They were not just taking it, you know, they were focused. They did the mitzvah 100%. That's the question. So the Moshe Rabbeinu said, okay, we, you have a, now it's time to shift. It's time to shift. How do you shift from the 100% to another entity? Right? That's really the question. You asked the question for how many mitzvahs are there? <laughs> it's not the, it's, you know, the, the, point of, the point is not about how many mitzvahs are there. The point is if I can give each mitzvah 100%, which I should give each mitzvah 100%. Now the question is how do I shift from one to another. That's really the question. That is the dilemma. That's the struggle. That is, no, but that's, that's the meaning of the forceful. The forcefulness is, how do we shift from A to B when you're 100% involved in A? And the Rebbe is going to answer that. How do you shift from mitzvah A, 100%, now I have to move to mitzvah B. Uh, so I'm living Torah, right? I'm 100% involved. And then somebody comes running into the show and says, listen, I need a minion for a funeral. How do I move from 100%? I'm involved in my little I say, you can't close the book. I'm 100%. I can't, I can't go away from it. I'm so, I'm so focused. I'm so involved. How am I supposed to close the book and go, 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 go to the funeral when I'm 100% involved in this stuff? It's different, it's different. But it, it says we should stop the Torah. But why? I can't. How do I do that? It's very difficult for me. I'm, I'm sitting here 100 percent involved in this book. Yeah, but, I, but I, that's very difficult for me to go. How do questions? How do I do it? I mean, it's very difficult to me because right now I'm rational. I have I'm 100 percent supposed to be involved in the book. I'm in the middle of the class. Imagine if suddenly a guy comes running in right now, says to me, listen. You know, to say the story about Shanti. <laughs> They say the story, the Baal Shem, they were sitting, they were learning, in measurables, they were learning Torah. And suddenly a guy walked in, a guy, a guy, a guy walked in and said, listen, my wagon broke down. You help me. You guys come out and help me push the wagon. And they said, oh, we, you know, we can't. We, we, what are we, not, you know, uh, we can't. So he, the guy, this guy, the wagon driver said, so I don't know the Russian word. You can, you don't want to. <laughs> you can't want to. So uh, yeah, I, so I don't know why I brought the story in, but okay. Uh, <laughs> no, that was the punchline. So the Balshenter said, in essence, we can't, but you don't want to, and that's. Right. You miss. Okay, very good. Yeah. 100%. You're not going to funeral because you know the guy. That's why it says it's a chesed shalem. So the funeral, the you can't say thank you to you. You're not going to funeral. You're going to funeral because this 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 neshama needs to you at the funeral. What? What do you mean? Yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, so, one hundred percent in every fiber of their being, so much so that it's impossible to entertain the prospect of another task. I'm if I'm one hundred percent in something, then nothing else. If I'm thinking about the next task, then you're not one hundred percent. You're ready, you're ready 99, you're ready 1% out of the test. 
So you're not, you not supposed to do that. You have to be a hundred percent such as pivoting away would be considered force. That's why pivoting away, going away from this task would be as if forced. The question is, how do you take a do that? How do we go from 100% on A to 100% B? How are the Jews takas supposed to go from this mitzvah of collecting this, the, 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 the sparks of, 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 of Egypt or the money, whatever you want to call it, they had a mitzvah to accomplish this mitzvah to acquire the sparks of all Egypt. And now, which they were 100% involved, now move over and start the next object, which you have to now be 100% involved in, in mitzvah number two by Yisrael to continue to join. The Rebbe says as follows, listen to this text, ready? You have to listen. You have to be focused 100%, okay? When a Jew receives an instruction from the code of Jewish law or from the leader of the generation, right? Then he or she must interrupt the current task and do the new task. At that point, the Jew is required to pull off something paradoxical. Ready? On one hand, a Jew must feel that the second new task is something forced for they are totally invested in the previous task at hand. In another hand, this very attitude ought to be compelled them to feel that they must inject life and passion into the new task, a real energy that is entirely unlimited. They have to realize, because it's both from God, it's both from God, right? Task A is the mitzvah and task B is the mitzvah. Task A needs to be 100%. And now he's demanding, I mean, task B, which is, needs to be 100%. In essence, David they gave me enough power and capability to be 100% in task A and then go 100% to task B. It's so much as a Jew is completely committed and devoted for whatever God wants while performing the previous task. As, 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 as uh, demonstrated by the fact that he, she is forced to pull away from it. And they therefore receive new energy and passion for the new task. So in essence, I'm in the middle of learning. And I'm, I'm in the middle of learning. And I'm in the middle of learning. I'm doing a task of learning. And suddenly somebody comes in here and says, I need you for a mitzvah. I cannot do it. I need you to come to a funeral, right? I need it. And the Shulchan Aruch says that I need to do that. Then I need to force myself to leave task A, which I'm 100% involved in, and go to task B and get 100% involved in task B. Because both are the will of our Kaddish Baruch. It's not that task A is God's wish and task B is some human's or person's wish. It's both a mitzvah. They're both mitzvah of a Kaddish Baruch. They're both God's mission. Mission A is God's mission, and mission B is, mission B is God's mission. Listen to the following story of the Rebbe Rashab. The story. So the transfer to the Fidika Rebbe, the people of the Rebbe, wrote, uh, was a prolific writer, he writes, Yeshiva student, there was a there was a Fabrengen. There was a Fabrengen with the Rebbe Rashab, his father, the fifth Lubavitch Rebbe. Yeshiva soon sang a song called Gerari Song. I'm not sure what it is. Two or three times, but they were undecided whether or not they should continue singing it. So one side of the room it was singing it, while the other side of the room was uh was quiet. We we're talking maybe. So uh, they would, uh, So one side of the room was singing, while the other side of the room started to shush them up. The Rebbe instructed them to sing. The Rebbe Rashab said to sing. But the crowd sang, sang in tepid manner. My father, the Rebbe Rashab, turned to me, the Fidik Rebbe says, and says, they're singing with a simple resolve without passion. I figure I should tell them to sing with more gusto. But my father said, 
So the Rafini could have said, I figured I should maybe tell them that, 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 that his father wanted to sing with more, uh, with more geschmack. But my father, the Rebbe, held me back and said, for whatever reason, the crowd is singing with a strained resignation today, very tepid. It is as if they really mean to do something else. And if they would rather be gone from here, they're really doing it, but they're really doing it in a way as if they wish it was already over with. And in their eyes, they're elsewhere. So that's what the Rebbe Rashab said, seemingly like, the, the, like, the, like the, this group is not interested in the Fabrengen. <laughs> they want the Fabrengen to be over. And they're, they're, they're in a different place already. <laughs> they want it to be over. They want it to be gone. This is not how it should be. Whatever we are, the Rebbe Rashab said, this is not the way things should be done. Wherever you are, you must be entirely there. The, 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 the hair out of Fabrengen. If they hear a fabreng, they should be tired out of fabreng. That's like sometimes you, you go, you give a class, or you you give a you have a, a gathering. There's talk. You're like, people, what what are you coming for? You came to have a conversation. You came to be part of a fabreng. So if you if you're at the fabreng, be at the fabreng. Don't be at someplace else. You want to be someplace else? Go someplace else. Be in place A when you want to be and, 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 and be in place A while you're in place B. Right? Later you may be elsewhere and you'll show the up there 100%. But as long as you're here, you must be here. Of course, when you get to the next thing, you'll be entirely present. As this demonstrates the truth or whatever you are engaged with. If it's true, you engage with it in a true invested manner. The main thing is that wherever you are, you should be there all the way, not looking to run to the next thing. So, of course, when you get to the next thing, we're present all the way. This is a very important point. Wherever you are, be there all the way. This is the hallmark of something that is true. When you are, wherever you are, and you don't want ever, and you don't you don't want to run away. Rather, you do it deliberately and intentionally. That's a powerful statement of the Rebbe Rashab self understood that don't come to one thing waiting for it to end to go to another thing. Be do whatever you do in life hundred percent. Be present in the situation, and Amir Hashem. When you'll when you 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 when the next thing is commanded to do, you'll move to the next thing. Maybe you may be through force, maybe whatever, but you'll come to the next thing, you'll do that next thing 100 percent So therefore, that ever this is a beautiful teaching that ever teaches us that the Jewish people were hundred percent involved in this in the midst of that they were acting. Moshe Rabbein had to force, not force them physically, had to force them to realize, to understand that they should they have it's time. To move a hundred percent into another action by your soul to go to to go to Mount Sinai, and that's the next obligation to put a hundred percent involved. And they have that capability, and they did what they ultimately were capable of. What a beautiful sikh and the Rebbe. Many of us can learn a lot of things from it. That uh, that we should maybe accomplish things in life. That whatever we do in life, we should do it a hundred percent, and uh, not to. Uh, uh, as we're doing one thing to think about something else and uh, not do that 100% and not do the other thing 100%, but to be focused and do something 100% and you could do it that 100%, the next thing 100%, the next thing 100%, the next thing you can do everything in life, you can do it 100% if you give your full attention to it. Okay, that's a Sikh of the Rebbe. Wish you a